computer set up at the department picnic. So there's probably more people here than boxes on the Zoom screen. That's correct. Sounds good. Okay, I think we might uh, go ahead and get started. Um, Dr. Lynch, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, hello to everyone, and thank you for joining this first installment of this fall seminar series. It's great uh, to see how many of you are joining, and particularly the, fo the folks in the picnic. Uh, my name is Marily Vega, I am one of this year's uh, seminar coordinators. And today we have a great speaker joining us from the North Carolina Zoo. Uh, welcome, Dr. Lynch, and thank you very much for uh, joining us today. But we've, before we introduce the speaker, we do have a few house rules. Uh, you already know the, the drill. Please keep your mics muted. Uh, we will be reserving a few minutes for questions at the end of the presentation, so just make sure to post those in the chat, and I will pass them along to Dr. Lynch. Or uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the questions at the end of the talk. And uh, the seminar will be recorded for those of you that are not for those that are not able to join us today. And if anyone wishes to reach out to Dr. Lynch uh, personally, I will be uh, pasting my email in the chat. So I will do that now. And you can uh, reach out to me so I can get you in touch. And so introducing today's speaker, we are thrilled to have Dr. Emily C. Lynch joining us from the North Carolina Zoo, where she holds the title of Associate Curator of Research. Some of Dr. Lynch's responsibilities at the zoo involve coordinating and monitoring animal welfare, and she also serves as administrator of the zoo's internship program in partnership with our very own North Carolina State University. In attunement with her passion for wildlife, Dr. Lynch's dissertation focused on baboons, she graduated in 2016 from the Rutgers School of Graduate Studies in New Brunswick, New Jersey, with her dis dissertation titled Paternal Kinship in a Matrilocal Society of Olive Baboons in Laikipia District, Kenya. And so some of her, her science communication and outreach can be easily accessed online as she has written a, a multiple pieces for the North Carolina Zoo blog, uh, which you can find on their official page. And with that, the floor is yours, Dr. Lynch. Great, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I'm happy to meet all of you and be here. Um, I'm just gonna, um, it's disabled for screen sharing. So can you give me that? Can you have a minute? Yes. Okay. All right. Just one second. All right. Can everyone see my, my titles page in my screen? Yes, all right, very good. Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining me today. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, this is, uh, I don't do a lot of talks now that I've joined a zoo, so it's really nice to be able to meet other academics and uh, be able to participate in these kind of uh, seminars. Um, please, I know that uh, you can contact me through your coordinator, but please also feel free to contact me directly if you have any questions about um, research at the zoo or my work or anything like that. I'm very interested in collaborating and what you guys are doing. So please reach out if this is something that you're interested in. 
So I thought it might be useful to bring you through my research career to illustrate the focus of my projects in academia and show the relevance to particular applied fields for wildlife. Uh, when considering an animal's well-being, it's good to have some kind of definition that we're striving for. Um, so in the zoo field, they use a term called welfare, and this is to describe an individual's overall well-being. And the AZA, which is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, a nonprofit which guides the practices uh, of accredited facilities, defines welfare as an animal's collective mental and emotional states over a period of time and is measured on a continuum from good to poor. So this definition, of course, is incredibly broad and vague. But what's most important to note here is that welfare is holistic and transitional. So um, one of these states, physical, mental, emotional, may affect another. And the changes in these states may vary over time uh, throughout the day, season, or year. So it's important to check in on welfare um, continuously. A more concrete approach towards defining welfare relies on breaking out five aspects of an individual's existence. So here we have the five domains model. This was originally proposed in 1994 by David Meller and Cam Reed. And this is kind of a revised take on the five freedoms, which you may be familiar with uh, for domesticated animals or lab research uh, pursuits. Um, and the five domains approach allows for uh, the distinction to be made between the physical and functional factors that affect an animal's welfare and the overall mental state of the animal arising from these factors. So here we consider the animal's nutrition, environment, health and behavior, how it contributes to the mental domain and goes into the overall welfare state. And over the past 20 years, this paradigm has been widely adopted as a tool for assessing welfare. And while it's generally used uh, as a tool to measure welfare where animals are directly affected by humans in daily activities, it can also be applied to wild animals and is beginning to receive more attention in these areas. So conservation practices, wildlife management protocols, hu and human behavior just anywhere in the world have important consequences on the daily lives of wildlife. And it's crucial to consider the, the welfare of these populations as well beyond those uh, directly managed by people. So we have identified the five areas of an animal's life that we must consider when assessing welfare. But the next question is, well, how do we even study welfare? How do we assess it? Um, so here's a visual representation to illustrate a useful way to approach the study of welfare. Essentially here, if you guys could see my, sorry, I'm a little sick. Uh, if someone could see my mouse here, you can see that you have um, the five domains and experiences. So these are essentially inputs or independent variables in a study such as temperature, diet, uh, sociality, go in and are experienced by the animal and then welfare comes out, right? So these are your measurable, uh, measurable things such as behavioral or physiological responses to that experience. Um, and it can be measured. And from this management decisions can be made that are guided by evidence and um, hopefully enhance the welfare state of the animal. Now the challenge is to identify what are the inputs and outputs to study if our goal is to improve welfare. And how do we know what's important to the animal? And this is where the understanding of the natural biology of animals becomes critical to the care and management of wild animals. So for group living mammals, where I focus much of my career uh, studying, social interactions play an important role in an individual's daily life. And social ties are expected to develop through uh, consistent and positive interactions between two individuals over time. And more and more research is being done on social mammals, which indicate that individuals with strong social ties uh, enjoy uh, lo longer lives, higher reproduction, and improved health. So it's essential to improve, improve our understanding of social structure and the nature of social relationships with the goal of advancing animal management protocols for both wild and captive animals uh, so that they can be specifically designed to minimize social stress and enhance fitness. So thinking back to our five domains, this is the area that I'm really focusing on uh, for most of my projects. Um, and thinking about how behavior and sociality uh, influence an individual's welfare. 
So to begin to understand the nature of sociology, uh, it's best to look at who were the preferred social partners. And there's widespread evidence that among group living mammals, relatives are often the focus of these positive social interactions. And these preferences can be explained by kin selection theory. And while I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, it's always really important to just kind of throw in like a little theory just to get everyone on the same page. So um, originally proposed by Hamilton in 1964, uh, he showed how an individual's own fitness uh, and reproduction can be advanced not only by their own reproductive success, by all, but also by that of their relatives. So this is what we call inclusive fitness. And in other words, because you share genes with your relatives, your genes can be passed uh, on through these other individuals, not just by yourself. So by helping these related individuals, you can also improve your own reproductive success. And this serves as an overarching framework for explaining why relationships with kin form the core of most social groups in, uh, among mammals. But of course, uh, tons of other species as well, which I haven't studied, but I'm sure a lot of you have. So I want to start by discussing uh, my doctoral and postdoctoral work with a focus on understanding the quality and consequences of relationship with kin. For long-lived mammals, uh, most of our understanding of kinship is derived from natural local species where females tend to spend their entire lives interacting with maternal relatives. So these are relatives through the mother. And these groups are primarily these non-human primates, cetaceans, and elephants. And among these groups, there's widespread evidence that females will maintain the strongest social ties with close maternal kin. So particularly sisters, mothers, and daughters. So males will disperse once they reach reproductive age, but females will spend their whole lives with each other, um, uh, forming these very strong social ties to these close maternal relatives. And uh, among these groups, um, it's just very clear that these are the focus of everyone's lives. But these rich and detailed studies on these species tend to overlook two very important points. The first is that other types of kin are present in this group and they may be valuable. And the second is that because these species tend to be long lived, it's possible that benefits associated with kinship change over time in who's benefiting you in different ways. So first let's discuss relationships with other types of kin. And this is what I was able to explore, explore during uh, my graduate work. In old world primate species like baboons, uh, they've been the focus of many kinship studies because they are terrestrial and super easy to observe. Maternal kinship is so easy to as assess due to live birth and nursing associations. And their social groups, as I just mentioned, are organized around these match lines. Uh, and again, this means uh, relatives through your mother and uh, through a common mother. But it's frequently forgotten that all individuals share a father. So for example, Cassie and Yolanda here form stable and enduring bonds with their female offspring, shown here, these are their babies. But there may be other kin-based relationships within this group. So Murray here can mate with Cassie and Yolanda and produce two daughters, Claire and Yasmin. And if adult males like Murray stay in the same group, there's an opportunity for paternal investment to evolve, where Yasmin here might benefit from interactions with her dad. And if reproductive skew is high, where Murray monopolizes most of the copulations, birth cohorts may be composed of paternal half sibs. So if Yasmin here is able to gain benefits from such paternal kin, like her father and paternal half sibs, it's likely that these relationships not only exist, but play an important role in her day-to-day -day life and improve her welfare. So to explore the effects of paternal kinship, I developed a research project where I united uh, behavioral and genetic data derived from a group of wild olive baboons. I conducted focal behavioral observations on immature baboons as they are also uh, consistently overlooked in kinship studies and more likely of course to have a father alive and present in the group. And to assess paternities, I collected fecal samples in the field and later conducted genetic analyses through my collaboration with NYU and UT Austin. So first we explored social relationships between immatures and fathers to establish that these animals can distinguish and show preference for one another. And to reiterate, again, in these societies, bonds among maternal kin, specifically half maternal sibs, mothers and daughters are thought to be the strongest bonds. And here we considered three types of dyads. So we have um, adult males and immatures without a father in a group, adult males and immatures with a father in a group, and father offspring pairs. 
And here on the y-axis, you can see the composite sociality index. And this is just a measure of bond strength. So the higher the score, the, the stronger the social bond. And we found that fathers and their offspring maintain significantly stronger social bonds compared to other adult male immature dyads. So not only are they recognizing each other, but they're consistently showing preference for one another. So the next question is, well, how do these social bonds translate into any kind of benefit? And the most measurable benefit for me was foraging. So we considered the quality of foods consumed by the juveniles as a measure of feeding success. And I was luckily able to work very closely with researchers at Hunter College with their wonderful nutrition lab to assess nutritional quality of the foods most commonly consumed by our baboons. And here you can see on the y-axis the percentage of total feeding bouts for the immatures broken out by specific co-feeding adults. So here on the top, you'll see the different adults that were in with, that were uh, sitting within close proximity to the juvenile while they were feeding. And here food quality was broken up into three groups, low, medium, and high uh, to denote ener energetic content of the resource. And if you're interested in the methods on that, you'll have to read the paper, it's quite complicated. Um, but we worked uh, with experts in this area. So we came to an agreement on how we were going to classify these foods. Um, so in short, we found that immatures were more likely to consume high energy foods when they were near their mother or father compared to when feeding near an unrelated adult or alone. And this is a really exciting finding because not only do we show that immatures maintain a relationship with their, with their father, but we're able to also show that these bonds lead to immediate benefits for the kids. Finally, we explored bonds among paternal absives. So we compared the, the bond strength, we're back to the CSI score that we looked at before, among three types of immature dyads non-kin, maternal half-sibs, and paternal half-sibs. Um, and the box on the right here indicates dyads where the focal's father was present in the group, and the box on the left for those without a father. And here we found that uh, paternal half-siblings with a father were more likely to exhibit close social ties than those without a father in the group. And we also see this really interesting weakening effect among maternal half-siblings. And previous research has shown that adult females tend to restrict close social bonds to a limited number of females, typically two to three. And maybe if a juvenile is investing in paternal sibs, this takes time away from bonds with other individuals. So these results suggest that not only do juveniles maintain close social bonds with paternal sibs, but these bonds may be just as valuable as those with maternal half-sibs. So it's also clear that fathers influence the social lives of their kids and play an important role in this social landscape of uh, developing immatures. So this work overall has demonstrated that relationships with paternal relatives are more important than previously thought and have the potential to significantly affect the health and well-being of immatures. And as an extension of this, it's possible that the disruption of these social bonds may have an important consequence on individual welfare and stress, which has larger implications, of course, for animal management pro protocols involving similar multi-male, multi-female natural local species. And through working closely with our on-site partners here, we were able to share our results and improve appro approaches towards uh, wildlife management endeavors, emphasizing the importance of adult males in these populations. So following my graduate work, I became interested in how the effects of kinship change over the course of an individual's lifespan. And I joined the Myanmar Timber Elephant Project and the University of Turku in Finland to explore the ramifications of living with and without kin in uh, Asian elephants. And you may wonder, well, how are you studying um, Asian elephants in Finland? Uh, the Timber Elephant Project has access to data derived from the largest population of semi-captive Asian elephants in the world based in the timber camps of Myanmar. So these uh, working semi-captive elephants are an integral part of the culture of many Southeast Asian countries. But due to high infant mortality and low birth rate, these populations are unsustainable and wild elephants are frequently captured to supplement these semi-captive groups. So therefore it's crucial that we formulate research questions that culminate in applicable recommendations to the timber enterprise to improve individual welfare and reproduction to stop uh, this capture. Getting back to the data, 
uh, the Timber Elephant Group maintains uh, access to these log books, which are similar to stud books found in zoos, dating back to the early 1900s, which provides information such as birth date, mother ID, date of death, etc. And this unique and massive data set can allow us to ask questions about the evolutionary consequences of various behaviors and social groupings in these animals. So using these data, I wanted to explore how reproductive success varied with access to maternal relatives. But before discussing elephant fertility, it's really important to recognize the probability of female reproduction changes over the course of an elephant's lifespan. So age-specific fertility in female elephants generally shows this uh, U-shaped curve, similar to humans, where there's uh, a low annual breeding success at ages 5 to 11, with this rapid incline, uh, ages 12 to 24. Then we see a rapid decline again, and then a slower decline. So because we're interested in fertility, we focused our study on females between the ages of 12 to 50, where we separated females into these three life groups, young moms, middle-aged moms, and older moms. And here, uh, I don't mean to overwhelm you, I'll take you through it, uh, but here on the uh, y-axis, we have the annual probability of reproduction um, and female age down here on the y-axis. So it's broken up again by young mom, middle mom, and old mom. Um, and we found that overall a sister's presence here in the yellow significantly improved a female's chance of reproduction for these young moms with a non-significant but positive trend here for the middle moms. And this is probably due to the precarious position uh, young females are in with regards to energy allocation as they experience this trade-off between investing in their own reproduction or continued growth. Um, so help from a relative might be essential to the survival of their offspring. Furthermore, these young females, uh, for these young females, we found a negative interaction between sibling presence and female age. So in other words, while sister's presence was overall valuable, it has a diminishing effect. You can see that it kind of goes up and then levels off. Um, so to better understand this effect, we then narrowed our focus to just this young mother group. Um, and oops, there we go. Um, and just looked at these young females, um, 12 to 20. And we found that having a younger sister living nearby significantly improved the likelihood of annual reproduction. And again, this time, we also see this uh, diminishing effect over time. And this may be due to the need for help young mothers face, as I just mentioned, as well as benefits a young pre-reproductive female may gain through assisting older relatives with their offspring, such as parenting experience. So my work with the Timber Elephant Project revealed that living near a maternal sister has important consequences for female reproduction, and this positive effect may be viewed as a health outcome, where relationships with kin can improve female well-being and reproductive success, which is important in this, in this case. Um, so through working closely with on-site organizations, again, we were able to make suggestions regarding uh, optimal work group compositions, specifically that young female siblings be kept together to promote uh, reproduction, health, and welfare. So while these projects revealed novel associations between kinship and fitness, the takeaway is that among long-lived social mammals, investment in social bonds positively affects health status, welfare state, long-term fitness, and reproduction. And with new insights into the quality and consequences of particular social relationships, management or conservation-oriented programs can be specifically designed to minimize stress and improve health and reproduction. So that gets us back to our circle here, where we have determined that critical inputs of, uh, to welfare may include relatives we didn't uh, consider before, and that the welfare needs of an animal may change over the lifespan. So moving on from academia and long-lived mammals, I now have the wonderful opportunity to bring scientific methodology into a fully captive setting with the goal of improving animal welfare among zoo housed animals. I'm currently working as the Associate Curator of Research here at the North Carolina Zoo. And in this position, I oversee different forms of research the zoo facilitates. So here's our original circle that we were talking about earlier for wild animals. And then this is the new circle, which I modified for uh, captive animals. So this is uh, animal care and management practices rather than wild, um, but still it's very similar, right? Uh, when we have management practices in the wild, animals affected, animal welfare comes out, same thing. But what's really cool about zoo work 
is that um, we can continually go through this circle and constantly assess inputs and outputs to uh, follow an animal over time, follow an animal across seasons, across its lifespan, and get that feedback of how different inputs are changing welfare. My primary focus is developing research that informs our husbandry plans with the goal of enhancing welfare. And this can be achieved through two types of work. Um, the first is multi-institutional studies. Zoos provide an excellent opportunity to understand uh, animal welfare. And in particular, zoos maintain these stud books for all of their animals, just like the ones I use for the timber elephants. And these stud books can be combined with survey data so we can ask questions about how various husbandry practices affect life history outcomes, such as reproductive success and survival. I'm currently working on a study that explores the effects of husbandry protocols on the health and survival of zoo house red wolves. Um, for some background on the red wolves, in the 1970s, there was uh, intensive predator control programs and ex excessive hunting, which led the US Fish and Wildlife Service to capture all the wild wolves and move them into captivity with the goal of propagation and later re uh, reintroduction. But it's been really challenging to reintroduce these wolves back into their native environment. And now with multiple, in now multiple institutions across the US um, house these wolves who are just waiting to be released. And this population of around 300 individuals is essential to the continued existence of the species where only an estimated 15 to 20 individuals remain in the wild. So within this zoo house population, I'm looking at survival rates and health issues across various management practices, including housing, diet, and social grouping. So one cool finding that I wanted to share with you um, was the relationship between uh, survival and transfer rate. And uh, if you don't know, across zoos, animals can be transferred frequently, not frequently, but um, are, they are transferred. And they've done studies like this for elephants and for cats, and they found a negative relationship between transfer rate and survival. Um, so getting back to this study, um, of the total population, 41% of the wolves in the stud book experienced at least one transfer during their lifetime. And in the wild, both males and females typically disperse from their natal group and may even engage in second or third dispersal events, depending upon access to food and mates. Uh, so separation of offspring from parents may be critical to the biology of the individual. So here we explored predicted survival probabilities for wolves who experienced a varying number of transfers over their lifetime. And we found that transfers have a cumulative and positive effect on survival outcomes. So for example, a wolf that is transferred once, uh, this blue line here, experiences a 17% increased likelihood of survival compared to this yellow wolf who never transfers. So confirming uh, my original idea that I was alluding to before, uh, some social or physiological benefit could be incurred from this transfer event due to the natural social structure, uh, which relies upon dispersal. And multiple transfers across facilities may mimic this dynamic, improving the animal survival outcomes. So in this case, when we consider an animal's social needs, we might uh, want to replicate natural social dynamics through transfers between facilities. Um, another important role of my job is to conduct research which aims to directly improve the care of our animals at the zoo. So relying on help from research interns, this, this uh, research program facilitates an adaptive management program. And what does this mean? Adaptive management simply relies on continuously, this is what I was talking about before with my welfare circle, continuously reassessing animal care protocols based on results from research. So all of our care practices are evidence-based and we create projects designed to target welfare concerns or needs throughout the zoo. Um, the results inform our animal care staff and can be integrated into management plans. And another benefit of this strategy is we can engage animal staff and help them better understand their animals' needs. And also, of course, uh, bring in uh, young researchers, um, early career kids, um, and show them how to do research, um, animal research. So as an example, we house a pair of Black Bear sisters at the zoo, Luna and Nova, maybe you've seen them. Uh, they've been noted to pace, which is considered a stress behavior. Uh, Kelly Bruno joined us as a research intern during the summer of 2020, following her graduation from UNC Charlotte, and was tasked to design a project which assessed overall activity and attempted to mitigate this pacing. So here's an image of the bear's habitat. 
Um, it's quite complicated. They have a lot of spaces at the zoo. So this is uh, on guest view. This is our main habitat. And then these are all their different areas that they have off of guest view. Um, access to various spaces change day to day. So they might be able to have access to these areas one day or this area, or maybe they're locked out some days. Um, but with an understanding of wild bear behavior, specifically how bears travel over large distances, Kelly believed it may benefit the bears to increase the space available to them. So she created a project designed to evaluate the effects of access on bears behavior. And allowing access uh, to different areas may serve two goals. The first goal uh, may function as a form of environmental enrichment where we're changing their environment. Um, they have more areas to explore. And the second may just give the bear more options for walking to mimic their wild uh, ranging behavior. So Kelly established a design where the bears had access, full access to all areas three days a week and limited access two days a week. Using aggregated data here for this image, um, Kelly found that full access was associated with a positive changes in the bear's behavior, particularly with pacing here. Um, the Y is mean percent of uh, observed time. And here on the X, we have all these behaviors. So um, full access uh, led to uh, a significant decrease in pacing. So this was a great finding. So from this study, we have a deeper understanding of the effects of our management on the bear's behavior. And following Kelly's reporting, we were able to inform the bear care teams that it's important to give the bears full access as often as possible. Um, to, and in the end, we're building on a strategy and designed to enhance the bear's care and welfare. So of course, uh, we went into the circle, giving them full access. We're assessing how it's uh, treating the bears. They're liking it. They're showing positive behavioral changes. Um, but we want to continue this circle, right? So we're going to put another intern on those bears and continually reassess, well, what can we do to continuously improve the welfare of these animals? So my last slide is um, uh, an advertisement for work at the zoo. Um, I'd love to get anyone involved who's interested. I offer research internships for undergrads, uh, which is formal training in designing and executing animal behavioral research with the goal to improve our management protocols. Um, we're also interested in supporting master's and PhD level projects. Um, I am working on a program with Dr. Jenny Campbell to support master's students. And we house a variety of species that may be difficult to access in the wild, especially during COVID, and also offer semi-controlled environments, which can be extremely valuable for various uh, research projects. So it's a great uh, research facility. And in addition, as an AZA facility, as I mentioned before, we have access to those longitudinal data sets of the stud books. So there are many opportunities for exploring various scientific questions that involve um, evolutionary based questions. So please contact me if you are interested in pursuing research at the North Carolina Zoo. Thank you so much for your time. I wanna thank my collaborators, co-authors and funders, and please contact me if you're interested in work with our zoo. Thank you. Oh, I was muted. Sorry. Thank you for that fantastic talk, Dr. Lynch. And everyone get your reactions in there for Dr. Lynch. Um, we will be open it up for questions, or you can leave your questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that invitation, Dr. Lynch, for potential future collaborations. I want to say just uh, once more that if anyone wants to uh, get in touch with Dr. Lynch, I know that she had her uh, emailed up in the presentation, but I will also leave my email once again in case you need to uh, write to me and I can get you in touch. So questions? Hi, I actually have a question. I'm Monica. Hi, Monica. Um, you found that you had increased success when you had young elephants that were housed with a sister present, and this was in the wild. Has this been looked at in terms of captivity or trying to implement it into zoos with keeping young females together? Um, I think, I, so I'm not super, I'm new to zoos. I just started my zoo work um, this year, but from my research from that paper, I think that generally zoos have the attitude of keeping females together for as long as possible. Um, so for sure, if you have, uh, 
this young female who's still reproducing. So, um, so those the critical age, that 20, 12 to 20 year age, um, she most likely, if she has a sister, which may not be likely because reproducing in zoos is quite challenging, um, they're most likely to keep them together just because they know that they're natural local and they should be together. Over in these Asian timber camps, they tend to, they, they separate families um, due to the harvesting needs, but they're very interested in improving reprodu reproductive success. So the goal of this was to show them that if you keep these sisters together, you will get more babies. Um, and so that's kind of helping guide them and giving them evidence that it's important to keep these uh, females together simply because they're just a natural local animal. Perfect, thank you so much. Sure. Awesome, any more questions? A quiet group, but maybe I answered all of them. And I hope that people in the picnic have a way to. <laughs> access the mic or, or so we can answer their questions. I can I can ask a question, and this would be perhaps a little more personal. But how would you uh, say that your transition going from academia to then working in the zoo? I know you still conduct uh, very original research uh, in mm -hmm. the zoo, but how do you feel that that trans transition went, and uh, what is your advice for those that uh, would like to do a similar uh, transition? Yeah. That's a great question. That's a great question. That's kind of what I was thinking about when I designed this talk is to show that there is like life outside of academia. It's really hard because, you know, you go through grad school and it's your life. Um, it's your life for a, a long time. And so it's hard to imagine life that's not designed like academia. Um, but um, for me, uh, for my, for what I'm interested in, I really enjoy um engaging in all of these different activities, these different research activities and not necessarily, um, and just kind of seeing like where I can contribute and help directly in this, uh, in this environment. And maybe at some point um, there's something else that I can uh, look to, but I'm really enjoying um, learning about, it's, it's fun because it's a whole, it's a totally different way of thinking. Um, it's a whole new mindset. I'm learning tons of new terms and methods and ways of working. Um, and, you know, not just sitting in front of my computer by myself for days on end. Um, so it's nice because I get to socialize and meet different people and I'm out there like it's like field work whenever you want it like you're out in the zoo working with them. Um, so I'm really enjoying it. I really like it. I miss um the engagement and I miss being able to turn to someone working next to me and like ask them uh yeah like the research camps that's right the research we also do offer research camps Cassidy's helped a lot um hold those those are first uh juniors and seniors I mean uh middle schoolers and high schoolers I should have advertised those as well if you guys know any uh, middle schoolers and high schools we run these uh overnight camps at the zoo um but, uh, but yeah, so I miss that kind of engagement with others who understand what I'm doing, where I can ask them about a particular statistical method or um, talk about, you know, kin selection theory, uh, things like that. But that's what I have you guys for and Dr. Campbell for, and I know who to reach out to for talking about that. Um, but I've really enjoyed, um, again, it's only been a year and a half outside of my postdoc. So we'll see what I say in a few years, but I think it's been, for me, it's been really um, satisfying. Fantastic, thank you. Anybody else have questions?
I have a question, but I did have to step out for a few minutes. So I'm risking asking something that somebody else already asked. Um, but did you talk about how these animals actually recognize who is related to whom? Like, oh, Elsa, that is a great <laughs> question. Um, I have slides on that too. Um, but for, so for maternal relatives, you would just imagine, I mean, there's so much research on this kind of stuff. Um, with how you recognize maternal and paternal, but just like a basic, like you see your mom nursing something that's probably your sibling, right? Um, you see your mom consistently sitting with someone else, like that's probably someone that you're going to be familiar with. Um, the fathers, it's trickier, right? Um, so if you have, in live in these multi-male, multi-female groups and the males are, and everyone's mating promiscuously, um, how do you know who your father is? And for the baboons, um, they have this uh, this male female relationship called a uh, friendship. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this kind of relationship before, um, but it's an anti infanticide strategy. So if a female finds a male um, and sits next to him and is always near him, uh, she's less likely to lose her offspring to infanticide. And so recently people have done some work to show that her male friend tends to be the father, right? So it's almost like these, um, uh, ver like these, um, what is the word? Like um, transitory pair bonds, right? Between a male and a female. And so it's thought that if a male is um, sitting near a female or always near the female, then the offspring will be there and they'll be in the presence of the male. So not only will they recognize that's my dad, but they'll also recognize that the kids around the dad might be um, some, someone to hold interest in. Um, so it might be due to shared proximity. Maybe there's something with smell. There have been tons of uh, MHC studies on smelling and um, the MHC complex. Uh, but I think that that's one strategy um, uh, in other species it tends to be association and proximity, I think generally. I haven't looked at the literature um, in a little bit, but that was the thinking when I was doing it, that it's everyone sitting around the same male, and so that's the guy. And typically the, the toughest male who's monopolizing all the copulations is the one who you wanna sit next to to avoid these scary new males coming into your group who might kill everyone. Cool. It's interesting then that when the dad is absent, that some kind of like, ad hoc relationship doesn't form with a male who is present. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So it may not, so that's the other thing also, that's a really good point too. So it may not be, it might be more than just your mom having a friend, right? Mm -hmm. Because if that male leaves, your mom might have a friend with a different male, but you're not gonna form that social bond. So yeah, there is something else going on there too. That's a great point. Yeah. Cool. Um, but yeah, it's really cool. And what's cool about baboons and primates in general is that um, you see, you have these closely related individuals, but if you have like throughout Africa, you have all of these different closely related species of baboons, um, but they have these very different social structures. So you can compare how these uh, social interactions vary in these different environments and what might be behind these different behaviors. So these Chakma baboons in South Africa, they have very high infanticide rates. Um, they have really short male tenure in these groups. So males are constantly rotating in and out and reproductive skew is very high. Um, and so you see friendships form more often. So I suspect that if you did a study like this down there, you would find paternal kinship to be very important. I don't think, I don't know if anyone's done it though. Thanks. Sure. We have another question in the chat. And it says, it's from Cassidy Hubbard. It says, what is the biggest challenge for conducting research in zoos? Oh, Cassidy, that's a great question. So Cassidy um, has been a research intern before and she's our master's student right now. So Cassidy might be familiar with some of our challenges. And that is, um, it's, it's cleaner than research in the field because you do have control over your inputs and your independent variables. You have some level of control over your independent variables, but in some degree it's harder because you're also negotiating with the animal care staff and we're an entertainment facility. So we also have to think about the visitors. So Cassidy had this great idea for our elephants that she wanted to install these um, hanging feeders, right? For the elephants, because it's been shown that when you give that, it's just a form of enrichment and engages them. It occupies their time and they show all these positive benefits with these hanging feeders. Um, but what's a challenge is that um, we, have to, we have to consider the guests 
We also have to consider where we rank in terms of priority. Like there are some animals that need an HVAC system like now. Um, so those get, so for our maintenance and facilities team, those guys get prioritized first. So for things like in um, our zoo is, um, you know, a cutting edge facility where we prioritize, of course, enrichment and generally our animals have amazing welfare. Um, but when you want to do a study like this and you're interested in testing it, you may not get it done in the time frame that you want it done. Um, so, you know, you have to be patient and wait uh, and think of other project ideas. But it, what's great about the zoo is that um, we're very encouraging of research. And so everyone tries to find a way to make, make stuff work. Fantastic. Let's see if we have, do we have any more questions? Now there's also a comment from Cassidy that is very loud in the picnic. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, if, so hopefully, um, if anyone has access to the chat, they can write their questions there. Awesome. So it doesn't seem like we have uh, any more questions. Um, if anybody <laughs> comes up with questions later, I left my email there. I wants to talk uh, to Dr. Lynch personally. Once again, you can reach out and I'll, I'll get you in contact. Uh, thank you for joining us very much, uh, Dr. Lynch. That talk was great and fantastic. I know uh, everyone uh, will have enjoyed it. Uh, people are reacting and saying thank you. And from NC State, uh, thank you very much and, and good luck in your future endeavors. Thank you thank everyone you so for much. joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been fun. All right, take care. Great, thank you everyone.